welcome everyone. I can see here the names of, of the people who have joined. And I have to say, it's great to see many of you who have been supporters of Silver for a long time. So I really want to, uh, to thank you for making the time to join this, uh, this webinar. Today with us, we have Lauren McGaugh, who's the head of investor relations. And uh, as obviously many of you know, she's also the, the daughter of Peter McGaugh. And uh, you know, Lauren has been instrumental in helping us translate all the work that we're doing on the ground to, you know, to in a language that's easy for investors to understand. And she also, you know, a very talented geologist in her own right. Her contribution, she, she attends all her technical meetings. And despite her, uh, her age, um, you know, wisdom that's uh, certainly beyond her years. And we're very, very happy and very grateful to have her as part of our team. So I did want to take the opportunity to publicly acknowledge you, Lauren, uh, really, uh, it's been uh, an incredible addition to have you in the team, and, and so welcome. I also wanted to take the opportunity to, to welcome Peter, Peter McGall, who is uh, really the, the person who has helped us with the concept of what we're doing here with three of what we believe are incredible assets. And uh, thank you, Peter, for taking the time this morning to, to walk us through this presentation. This uh, presentation, since it's primarily for existing shareholders, what we're going to do is do a, a little bit of a deeper dive into each of the assets technically. Um, and then, of course, towards the end of the presentation, we'll share with you what the plans are for the exploration for the next uh, few months, uh, talking a little bit about what we have accomplished and what to look for and what the strategy going forward is. I did want to thank you. A lot of you sent questions in advance. And for those of you who are connected, you know, if you're connected through the, through the um, um, Zoom system, you're able to send your questions, so please do. We actually received quite a large number of questions, which I'm, uh, you know, thank you very much for doing that already in advance. Uh, feel free to add more questions. We might have to group some of them um, in sort of similar categories so we can go through all of them. And there, was one question in particular that, that did come a fair bit, which is um, you know, some of you may or may have not heard about the a, a new uh, amendment to the mining law in Mexico that was announced on Friday. I think uh, certainly a lot of people have been asking me about it. I think maybe, um, you know, and this is one of Lauren's suggestions, um, especially given the fact that just in the last few minutes before the start of the webinar, I received a maybe three or four people ask me about it. Maybe I'll take a, just a very brief moment to discuss it now. And then uh, towards the end, if there's more questions about it, I'll be happy to answer them. As you can imagine, I've been watching this like a hawk for many, many weeks. And um, uh, as soon as the announcement came, besides reading a number of independent reports from some of the investment banks, for some, from some of the consulting firms. I've also consulted with our local contacts and lawyers. I think the big, the big conclusion is uh, it's a law that still has uh, a, bit, a bit to go before it gets approved. But that the big conclusion that I will draw is that it has little to no effect on, on the properties that we have. It applies more to, um, to new properties, to, to the system that will be implemented in, um, in, uh, in having you know, new concessions issued. But um, you know, for the, the conclusion from both reading independent reports, as well as consulting with our legal counsel, our advisors in Mexico and, and our contacts with government, is that this uh, new law will have little to no impact uh, for Rena Silver. And of course, uh, during the question and answer session, I will be very happy to, uh, to um, add if anybody wants more uh, of a nuanced uh, explanation, um, I'd be happy to, to discuss to, you know, to the extent of my knowledge. So with that, what I would like to do now is uh, turn the presentation over to Lauren, who will give us a very brief overview of, of um, what the presentation is about. And then we'll pass it on to Peter to walk us through each one of our three projects. And then towards the end, I will come back and talk a little bit about the, the plans for the next uh, few months. So with that, Peter, um, welcome. 
Well, thank you very much. And uh, that was very sweet to say. And then, you know, just to say thank you to the investors as well for joining us. Um, you know, as you know, Rain is Silver, our approach is we're taking what's called an OR systems approach to exploration. So the idea is that we're looking for the full system. We're going into, you know, historic districts with our Gigi and Batapilas projects, and we're looking for the other portion of the system because we feel that gets us the highest chance of finding something that's high grade and district scale. Of course, we're gonna be making forward looking statements. Uh, it's important to do your own homework and see whether or not this is the right investment for you, you know, whether it's Raina Silver or any other investment. So Raina Silver has three projects that we feel fit through that high grade district scale filter um, that have exploration potential and are in silver endowed mining districts. And the team that's behind these projects, whether it's Jorge from the capital market side or the exploration team led by Dr. Peter McGaw, as well as the geologists who are boots on the ground, you know, they are serially successful in their own right in terms of their record for discovery. And it's because of that and because of the projects, because of the team, that we've had the strong support from, from you guys, institutions, board and management, and that has allowed us to have the funding for success because as you guys all know, discovery is what drives the value of junior exploration companies. And that is made through the drill bit. So we have three big projects, Badapilas, Gigi, and Medicine Springs. Badapilas and Gigi originated with Mag Silver. Uh, Botapilis and Gigi are also in the state of Chihuahua. So Botapilis is a historic native silver district where not only have we found additional high grade silver, but we also found gold for the first time in the district. And we've been spending the past year figuring out how that new style of mineralization fits into the overall framework of the deposit. And we'll be going into what we've been doing for the last year and how that's led us to the drill targets that we're gonna go out and get those rotary truth machines going here pretty soon. Our other two projects are carbonate replacement deposits. Uh, we'll let the expert on CRDs give you sort of a rundown on how we approach exploring and carbonate replacement deposits. He is actually at the heart of the Santo Lalia mining district, which is one of the world's largest carbonate replacement deposits. And from what we know studying CRDs and Santo Lalia in particular, we know that that half a billion ounces of silver production historically came from just half of the carbonate replacement deposits spectrum. So what we're looking for there is the source and to work our way out from there. And we're excited to be doing some geophysics and pulling those pieces together. So that way we can go to the next stage of drilling with Gigi. Our third project is up in Nevada, that's Medicine Springs. And there we think that it, the project potentially holds that full carbon replacement deposit spectrum. So from very distal portions, we just finished reconnaissance drilling in the fall, trying to see whether or not we had the right rock type and to see whether or not we had some high grade right off the top, see whether or not this is a rain of silver quality project. And in the first hole, we had over a kilo silver across 2.4 meters. And we spent almost the entire 787 meters of that first hole in carbonates and continue to do so in the other holes. So in terms of the question of, is it high grade and is there the room for this thing to get big? We felt that the answer to that was yes. And that this was a rain of silver quality project that we needed to drill. And we're gonna be doing that here in September, 2023. So you guys know the characters. My father's chief technical advisor. We'll let him dive into the CRDs and the other styles of the exploration that we're working on from his vast experience. And on top of that, I would like to make note, uh, the two geos that we have working on our projects down in Mexico. These are serious geos in their own right. Uh, Rene Ramirez, who runs our Gigi project, 
He's been working alongside my father for the better part of 30 years for work at Juana Scipio and work on Exelon. And Manuel Ruiz was involved with Mag Silver at Cinco de Mayo. So, you know, it's not just a case of having my father as the advisor. It's the team that has been working together for these years, making these big discoveries. That's who we have working at Reign of Silver. So I guess now I'm going to put it off, uh, hand it off to uh, my father to talk about carbonate replacement deposits and uh, dive into some of the technical information. Well, thank you, Lauren and Jorge, and good morning, everybody. Glad you're aboard. Um, I, I, I realize with silver up almost 50 cents and gold up 30 some odd dollars that you may be somewhat distracted by looking at your tickers, but uh, uh, do hope to, to manage to get your attention here. So let's talk about the CRD exploration model in general. Um, Lauren has the pointer, so she'll have to, uh, to help me out here. But essentially what you have is an intrusive body. So magma body, it comes in uh, from depth in the Earth's crust. It expels heat and fluid to the rocks around it, where those rocks are carbonate rocks, like limestone or dolomite. There's a reaction between those fluids that causes first scarn formation to occur, and scarn is just a fancy name for high temperature alteration, and then the scarn and the limestone around it gets overprinted by massive sulfide replacement. So the ore bodies essentially consist of a mixture of iron, lead, zinc, silver, and copper sulfide minerals. And these deposits can be oriented laterally or vertically when they're oriented laterally, as in the case of Gigi, um, you can have as much as six to eight kilometers between the intrusive source and the end of the mantos. Uh, they do affect the rocks above them as well. So you have an alteration halo uh, that you can use to try to define where that intrusive source is. So when you want to explore one of these systems, there's sort of two ways to do it. Historically, people found them in outcrop and followed them back towards the source. Uh, now, understanding that as you get closer to the source, the mineralization gets larger scale, grade drops a little bit, you get much more consistent and much larger uh, mineralization bodies. Uh, we look for the source system to try to work both ends against them. That's the basic explanation. To be uh, that we take. So let's take this to, to Gigi, I think, is first and uh, see where that takes us. So the Sandio Lalia district is one of the world's largest CRDs. And I, I should mention that I've been working in CRDs for about 40 years. Uh, and until about eight years ago, they weren't that well known or, the, or that popular in the investment community. And then South 32 paid one and a half billion dollars for Taylor deposit in Arizona. And that has changed people's perspective of these deposits quite a good deal. Uh, so there's a lot more work being done in CRDs and discoveries are being made using the ideas that we've generated over the last 40 years. So Sandy Eulalia, as Lauren mentioned, half a billion ounces of silver production at an average grade of about 10 ounces per ton with 15% combined lead and zinc. We believe that comes from only half of the zoning that I just showed you. And so we're looking for that source and the near intrusion, large volume mineralization. As they say, the best place to find a mine is in the shadow of the head frame. That head frame sits just barely to the north of our property. Next, please. So this shows that um, it's a long section through the district. The inferred intrusion is down there in the lower right-hand side, the known part of the district, the chimney manto system that produced all of that silver is up in the upper left-hand side. And as you work to the south, the limestones that post mineralization are covered by pre-mineral altered volcanic, shown in that, I'll call it buff color because I know that drives Lauren crazy. Um, but anyway, we're trying to look through those altered volcanics to find one or more intrusive centers and scarn zones. The idea being in part that if 
the distal half of the system can create half a billion ounces of silver, there's a good chance that the metal endowment of the more proximal zone is comparable. So that's what we're looking for in general, but we're not just looking for more mineralization right around that intrusion. We have 1200 meters of carbonates between the intrusion and where those volcanics come in. And based on some of our recent results and review of the core the other day, uh, we think there's a good possibility for additional high-grade massive replacements like you see at the left-hand side that was historically produced uh, within the system. Let's go on. Please. This shows the property boundary. Uh, we have about 4,800 hectares here, as I remember. Um, the various circles show where the drilling has been done. Our drilling has been concentrated in sort of the northern nose uh, for the last year or so, because that's the direction the results were taking us. Uh, and then that north-south line that you see there sort of runs down through the middle of the latest and most successful drill. Next, please. So what these results show is that we have two styles of, we've encountered two styles of mineralization. Those hot pink circles that you see at the bottom and the paler pink ones that you see behind them, which are actually, they, they look like they're higher up in the section, but they're just projected to the section. That's the SCARN mineralization that we have found at depth associated with a previously undiscovered intrusive uh, dike or sill. So not only have we found the SCARN we were looking for, although not yet in contact with the source intrusion, we have found another intrusive phase that is probably sourced from that same intrusion. So we have the deep zone with the high-grade multi-stage SCARN. So this is multiple packets of fluid coming off of this intrusion, telling us it's a, it's a juicy, multi-long-lived long long system. And then the red dots, the red circles you say above, are places where we have seen the kinds of high-grade silver, lead, zinc, veining that we expect to see sort of as bleeders from a massive sulfide ore body. These are the same styles of veining that the old time miners used to encounter and then would follow back into our bodies. Uh, so we're certainly hoping that one or more of these um, turns into one of those. Next, please. So this just gives you an idea of some of the grades that we've encountered in those sulfide veins up high, two meters of 233 grams, four and a half meters of 106 with some nice lead and zinc. Um, that's what we want to try to follow into more massive sulfide mineralization. And then the deeper holes from, from hole 31 there, you can see a series of intercepts um, with the overall intercept of 35 meters, giving us uh, an ounce or so of silver and four and a half, three and a half percent lead and zinc, uh, but with much higher grade intervals like two and a half meters of 130 grams silver, um, 0.7 of 338 and 0.18 meters, not very thick, but over a kilogram silver. Uh, and then a deep um, lead zinc zone, uh, three meters of nine, almost 10% uh, with one and a half meters or almost two meters of 16%. So we're seeing the right metals that we wanna see in these holes. Uh, we're just trying to get them into uh, more current coherent, larger scale bodies. Worth pointing out that our drilling is on 450 to 700 meter centers. So it's not like we're trying to offset one hole with another. As Lauren said, we're following the ore systems approach, trying to get vectored in on where we believe that source to be. So we've now got several holes into this uh, with some very nice grades, as much as almost 55 meters of coherent mineralized SCARN with at least four or five different stages of mineralization affecting. Again, that's indicative of the fact that we're near a large pulsing magnetic source. Next, please. So what we've got or the status at Gigi right now is uh, we're looking at the information from our drilling to tell us what direction does our drill information tell us to go to go towards the source? And how do we use these upper level feeder bleeder type structures to try to get into 
high-grade mineralization close to the surface. So this deep drilling has allowed us to apply ground truth to our previous pre-existing pre geophysical data. We had a lot of very detailed geophysics that had been run before that had never been drilled. And the results tell us that that geophysics was seeing some interesting things, but we needed to go back and do a little bit more geophysics to try to get um, a little tighter idea of the picture. And, and, and with the NSAMT we're doing now, NSAMT stands for a mouthful, which is natural source audio magneto to larynx. Um, you don't necessarily need to know how that works, except to know that at the moment with the sunspot activity that we've got, it's a very strong natural source. So we're getting very good resolution um, with our, with our, from our results. So we're putting all of that together to come up with some new drill targets. And uh, as we were talking before the thing started, uh, we commenced working with the MDRU group out of UBC in, in Vancouver. Uh, this is a district scale, they call it the Carbonate Footprints Program. I've been working with them on it for almost 10 years. And the idea is mixing carbon and oxygen isotopes uh, and a number of other geochemical and alteration features to try to determine system vectors for exploration. We've been very successful in other deposits, uh, important deposits, and so we're very excited to be applying this here. So all of that will lead into our phase three drill program. Uh, which we hope to do uh, pick off sometime later in the year. Uh, but drilling these days is expensive. So the more information we can get to not drill holes in the wrong place, we think is, is money and time well spent. So now we move on to Medicine Springs, Lauren, just to keep me moving. Medicine Springs, same exploration model, but in Nevada instead of Mexico. Uh, this is in an area of Nevada that has had a couple of very large scale CRDs uh, found historically, the Ely District and the Rica District, where I-80 is making a lot of inroads these days, um, which is also a CRD system. So Medicine Springs appears to be a CRD exposed at the most distal end, but even though we're looking at it way up there in the Monto and Vein zone, when we put together what we see in the field with what we've seen in the drill core, we can tick 11 out of the 13 boxes that tell us there's a major system here. So this checklist is based on examination of dozens of important CRDs around the world and lots of unimportant showings. Uh, these are the features we want to see and we're very comfortable uh, to be able to see this many of these features this early in the program. So it is it has location on Main Street. So it's in a known CRD porphyry bed. We proved it's at the top of the carbonate section. That gives it room to grow. And as Lauren mentioned, we got some high grade silver, which is what we like to see early on, tells us that the system is well into out. So let's move on with Medicine Springs. So Medicine Springs is um, strongly marked by northeast southwest structural trend you can actually see it in this map going up in the, in the drainages and those those structures are marked by very well developed jasperoids which is just silicified limestone silicified by what is essentially the exhaust after mineralization so we covered the area with about 850 samples uh, we came up with this zoning uh, that shows very nicely a zone from copper to lead zinc to silver, which is sort of a classic zoning you would expect to see, um, which gave us an idea of where to begin. Uh, we started with holes drilled into those three areas that you see there, the Golden Pipe, Silver King, and Silver Butte. Um, at Golden Pipe, we got two and a half meters of over a kilogram of silver. Uh, and at Silver Butte, we got seven and a half meters of 186 grams of silver. Um, those holes, are, those areas are separated by 1.75 kilometers. Uh, Silver King is sort of in between. A shorter holes there uh, also got good carbonate and whiffs of mineralization, not as strong as we did in the other places. It's worth pointing out that there has never been any drilling done to the southwest of Golden Pipes. So the three holes that went in there are the first drilling ever in that area, and it is littered with small old prospects and small mines. Um, so to hit these kinds of results over this kind of area uh, 
and looking at the results we got tells us there's a good size system there. We just have to keep going. Next, please. So the section on the right shows the thickness of carbonates. Everything that's blue is favorable for replacement mineralization. So we're looking at about 800 meters of section there. Uh, again, you can see the numbers of what we got uh, from, those, from those drill holes. So our goal really was to find mineralization, prove that the system could grow. We were able to tick those box, or boxes very comfortably. Next. So, Moving forward with Medicine Springs, we, we need to, you know, questions arise is what is the framework of the deposit depth? How does it relate to surface exposure? So we're working with the drill results and what we see on the surface. We've got pretty widely spaced drilling, but we're looking for vectors that tell us which way to go towards more substantial mineralization. So one of the ways we're going to do that is we're gonna do an airborne geophysical survey over the whole property uh, and then combine that with the results of our reconnaissance drilling uh, and do some additional sampling of areas that sort of appear to us in that process as needing additional, um, additional work. So the whole goal being to vector towards more proximal mineralization, identify and map out the mineralization pathways uh, and continue to drill uh, looking for the source of this system. So that's what we're going to be doing through 2023, and we hope to be drilling by sometime in the summer. Moving to our last project, uh, the Botopilis Native Silver District, in southwestern Chihuahua. Uh, there's over 30 known veins that were produced from 1632 to 1912. Those produced over 30, 300 million ounces of silver and an average grade of over 1,500 grams, but the grades and some of the ore bodies were as much as 75% silver. The thing that you see behind my head is actually crystallized native silver from Botopilis. The ore bodies consisted of rillo pads of this stuff and calcite. They mined it out, they smashed off the calcite, they poured the silver in molds, and that's one month's production from 1906 of silver derived from the native silver rich ores. Next, please. So the district has a, a long history uh, prior to uh, our entering the property with Mag Silver in 2003. So it goes back to 1632. Uh, Mag did some extensive work, uh, including getting a few high-grade drill intercepts. Uh, the problem for Mag, as it was with Gigi, is it was a victim of our success at um, Municipio, which is now in production. Uh, and so these properties were passed on to Rain of Silver uh, in exchange for a hunk of Rain of Silver. Uh, and we've been moving the projects forward ever since with Rain of, since 2018 when Jorge put Rain of together. Uh, so we've done a phase one drilling program. We have found additional high grade silver in the district. But as Lauren alluded to, uh, We've also had a big surprise. We came here for silver and we found a bunch of gold, which we didn't expect. So now we're trying to figure out what does that mean? Next book. So I guess I've mentioned all of this. Ore grades ran up to 75% silver. Few districts in the world where major mineral is native silver. Cobalt Ontario is an example. Kongsberg in Norway uh, is another example. But the mining in this district was historically what we call stope and hope, which means they just kept the structures in the face and followed them until an ore body would, would blossom. Uh, and essentially when they downed tools during the Mexican revolution in 2012, uh, the district was abandoned and has effectively seen no significant work uh, since then, except for the work Mag and now Raina have been doing. Next, please. So within the three parts of the district, and I should have mentioned that on this previous slide, to the southwest, we have the silver zone. To the northeast, we have the newly discovered gold zone. And then in between, we have overlap of silver and gold mineralization. So one of the things we've seen in the process of tracking from the silver zone to the northeast was we actually got some nice native silver in outcrop and in, in one of our drill holes. But then we started to pick up all this gold. 
occupying the same overall structure, but clearly a different stage. As I mentioned, the silver is associated with calcite, the gold is associated with quartz. Uh, we don't have the cut cross cutting relationships down to a great level of confidence, but it appears that the gold zone, gold mineralization is slightly younger and overprinted on the silver. Uh, and this is how things look when we started uh, with our drilling, where we got a hole with 3.6 meters of eight grams gold. Uh, I sort of consider two meters of eight grams gold minimum for mineable gold but on an underground basis. So we're well over that bar. Uh, and as I said, in our drilling, we got 3.2 meters of 700 grams silver. So we're very happy with the results that we're getting um, and really have refocused on the district scale uh, to go after the gold. Just to give you a comparison on the left, um, you see the silver mineralization. This is high grade calcite native silver where that Swiss army knife is. That's all native silver in the core right next to it. And, you know, that narrow 20 centimeter zone of silver ran better than 10 and a half kilograms per ton. So one and a half, one percent of silver. Talk about silver percents. And then the hole on the and then the core on the right shows the gold zone, a series of narrow quartz veins containing, containing high grade gold. We saw that there was some native gold in here. We knew it was coarse. So in addition to getting our standard assays, we sent this for metallic screen assays to be confident in the gold numbers that we got. And actually the metallic assays came back a little higher than the, just the conventional fire assay. So uh, we convinced ourselves doing the right kind of due diligence that the gold was real. Next, please. So what we've done uh, since then, and you can see areas where we have done a lot of sampling, uh, which has been primarily uh, outcrop sampling. Uh, gold samples are shown with gold circles, silver is shown in blue. Uh, you can see the transition from silver to gold from southwest to northeast, we're actually been, been surprised by finding gold in areas that historically were considered silver only. And then on the southeast side of the river, uh, we're getting quite a splash of gold uh, in and around and on top of uh, the historic silver mines. So these, what's emerging very quickly is two, se two separate centers of gold mineralization uh, with this overprint on the silver. Uh, giving us uh, an awful lot to work with. It's a lot of fun to be able to break open the district. So where are we in the timeline from Botopilis? Our, obviously our question from previous drilling and surface sampling was how does the newly discovered gold mineralization fit into the district um, picture, especially in the context of it being historically native solar? Uh, and also, what is the geometry and the control of the ore shoots in the veins? Uh, they open and close. Uh, in other words, the histor historically, they followed a two centimeter calcite vein that would, over a, a, a lateral distance of three to five meters, open up to a half a meter, to two and a half to three meters wide of high grade um, native silver mineralization that would continue for 50 to 80 meters and then it would narrow down again. And then they would recognize that these were inclined shoots of mineralization as much as 350 meters down the long axis. So you can imagine what these ore bodies were like. And we would like to understand better what the control on where those openings are. So, in addition to a detailed AMT geophysical study to try to get a better idea of where the structures run, plus all of the sampling we've done. Uh, from the old mine workings, and previously underexplored structures and, and outcrops, we have undertaken a two-stage in-depth structural study, one of which is going on right now uh, with a structural expert on the field working out why the openings and veins are where they are. We put all of those data together combined with previous information, uh, be prepared to drill uh, again later this year. So, Lauren, would you like to speak to the catalysts? They've heard enough from me, I think.
you're 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 muted on your phone. Yes. No. I'm. I was. I was trying to win the fight with my phone, and I was. I was losing. Both. Okay. So, you know, at Bada Pilas, what we've done is Can't we've been spending. You. Oh, that's my fault. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. My, my, my speaker turns itself off automatically after a while. So, so I bought a P-list, uh, where we will be drilling here soon, actually. We've been spending this past year after the big goal discovery, refining those drill targets, figuring out what the overall framework is, that's geophysics, the sampling, the structural survey, putting those pieces together, pulling together strategic drill targets, and we'll be drilling that here in Q2 of 2023. At Gigi, what we've been doing is establishing targets for the phase three drilling program, refining those using this geophysics survey to better get an idea of, you know, how do we vector towards the source as well as potentially go after some of those upper level structures as well. And we'll be preparing those for a phase three drilling program. And then Medicine Springs, we've been taking the, the the information from that reconnaissance drilling in the fall where it proved itself to be a rain of silver quality project with the potential for high grade and district scale and what we've done is we've taken that data we're going to be combining it with you know at the ground truthing that resulted from the drilling so far and putting that together with new geophysics new airborne geophysics that we're going to be running here soon taking all those pieces compiling it refining our drill targets and getting ready for our drilling program in summer 2023. Uh, we can go into this in a little bit more depth, but I'm gonna pass this off to uh, Jorge. And yes. uh, the general moral of the story is we have 150 million shares outstanding. Uh, we made that raise in February for 8 million and we have significant institutional support and what that's allowed us to do is go and put together these catalysts uh, that we've got coming up with drilling to make a big discovery. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren. Thank you very much, Peter. That was a great presentation.